The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, preparing society and meeting the needs of an aging population. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Quadero. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have on Skype today? On Skype today, we have Anand Iyer, who is assistant professor at the University of Alabama, University of Alabama at Birmingham, who is uh, in the division of um, pulmonary allergy and critical care. Uh, he also has an appointment in the Center for Palliative Care at UAB. And he's the founder of hashtag Pallypalm. Hashtag Pallypalm. We will talk more about that. Uh, so before we talk about hashtag Pallypalm. Um, welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. Welcome. Do you have a song request for Alex? Yeah, it's probably your first person from Alabama. I got to choose a song that came out of Muscle Shoals. Hopefully your audience knows about Muscle Shoals. Probably every hit from the 60s came out of there, uh, the I've same recording studio. Never so heard of it before. Plan. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> Google it. So Aretha Franklin, Leonard Skinner, Rolling Stones, everybody recorded there. So Land, Land of a Thousand Dances by Wilson Pickett. Let me see what you got. All right. Got to know how to pony, like Bonnie Maroney, mashed potatoes. Do the alligator Put your hands on your hips Let your backbone slip Do the what to say Like my little Lucy uh. ah. 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 I need somebody help me out just one more time Come on now <laughs> yeah, awesome. Work. That is a jam. That is a jam. That'll get your two year old dancing right there. That was a fun one. Uh, that was awesome. I, I got the energy now. I don't even need coffee. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, Pally Bum. What the heck is Pally Bum? Is that a type of berry? Yeah. Pally Bum is an online community I started last year to. Uh, of, clinicians, investigators, patients, and caregivers to bring palliative care to people with chronic respiratory disease. And now it's grown to be something worldwide. But if you're a fan of Star Wars, uh, I think Pally Palm is more of a higher state of being. It's where you can bring the best of both disciplines into one person. So palliative <laughs> care, <and> pulmonary <laughs> medicine. It's a good side of the force. I love it. Wait, that was an analogy about like bringing together the good side and the dark side into one person or something like that. <laughs> no, I don't know about pulmonary being the dark side, but <laughs> I, know, I was going to ask which is the, the light, which is the dark. Uh, that's good. That's good. Um, and you've written a lot about this um, and it focused a lot on, on COP. How did you get interested in this as like a, a topic? like everything it starts at the bedside you know you could care for patients as a resident you probably we've all probably admitted dozens if not hundreds of patients uh, with COPD exacerbations in the hospital or seeing them in clinic and find out that they have a lot of needs not only extending for their own but to their family members and as a fellow I did more of that and saw that those needs were huge and I was the one that was intubating them and so over and over and over and to a point where that gets to you <laughs> psychologically, where you're like, what's going on here? They don't know what's happening in their disease course and their utilization is high uh, and coming to the hospital over and over. Plus, they just have a really poor quality of life near, their, near the end of their lives. And they could really use palliative care, but we're never getting it. So I started out as a, made that a research career. A lot of my initial research was very clinical and things like pulmonary artery enlargement and uh, Medicare samples. But I'm shifted into how does palliative care fit into this picture uh, in the last few years. And I can imagine there's a kind of an analogy with heart failure in palliative care. In one way, like when we think about heart failure specialists, some of the best symptomatic management for dyspnea and heart failure is really good heart failure management. 
And I could see, like, for the same thing, like, some of the best ways to treat dyspnea in COPD is really good COPD management. So when we think about the needs for these patients, if we just focus on really good pulmonary care of their COPD to treat their dyspnea, like, you really need another specialist involved in their care. Do we have all the needs met? Uh, big answer is no, we don't. Um, dyspnea is just one piece of the puzzle. Yes, it's one of the biggest pieces, but so is depression, anxiety, uh, and an inability to cope, and prognostic awareness. These are all themes that I've discovered in my own research, but those extend to the patient and their caregiver. So there's a lot to offer from not only palliative care, but geriatrics uh, in the broader scope. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of your research. So you, you did a study in Annals of ATS, American Thoracic Society, looking at some of the needs for patients and family members. Do you want to describe a little bit about kind of what you did there and what you found? Yeah, that was a qualitative study of patients with moderate to severe COPD and their family caregivers. We had audio recordings, semi-structured in-depth interviews, and then conducted a thematic analysis and discovered five major themes raised by patients and their caregivers. Those were coping with COPD, emotional symptoms, respiratory symptoms, illness understanding, and prognostic awareness. But what was unique about that study was focused in on early palliative care, and that's palliative care long before the end of life. Uh, patients and their caregivers universally accepted the concept, had they, although they had almost never heard of it. And these five need, these five themes of needs were shared across disease severity. So it wasn't just something which is currently happening that you should wait until the end of life to do. Rather, you could start incorporating it in less severe COPD. And that was, that's been the whole crux of my research the last two years. Don't wait till they're on the vent in the ICU to start palliative care. And when you, when you talk about early palliative care, what were you what were you talking about there? Were you talking about early identification of palliative care needs and having like primary palliative care where people are addressing those needs, or is it early palliative care and COPD where you're getting early specialist level palliative care um, for these individuals with COPD? Great, great question. I mean, I have as one of my mentors Maria Bakaitis, who sort of help to bring about this field of early palliative care in oncology. And, you know, that's at the di time of diagnosis in, can in advanced cancer. So that's a little bit trickier. It's hard to say you can do early palliative care in the diagnosis of COPD. But you would want a pulmonologist or a primary care clinician to have a basic set of primary palliative care and geriatric skill set to start the process of whenever they uh, see a patient, whether that's at moderate, severe COPD, or even milder stages, to recognize that they need to start initiating something. And then when things get a little bit tougher, refer over. Um, there are plenty of figures from CAPSI and other organizations that illustrate this nicely. The um, amount of the dose of Jerry Powell gets to be more and more as that person gets closer and closer to the end of life. And in the study and in, in, in talking with patients and family members, was there anything that surprised you as far as their needs? Well, I think the coping one was just brought up so much. They didn't have an idea of what to do with their illness, like how to do things. One guy just talked about uh, it took him all morning just to bring up the energy and the will to go and empty his dog wa water bowl for his dog. And so he talked about that was his primary focus for the day, was just to get over there, change his water bowl for his dog. And I thought, okay, well, that's that's incredible. That's a lot of social isolation. There's a lot of depression there. There's a lot of, uh, you know, physical mobility issues. Let's see, how can we get his strength up? And I started thinking about all these things that I could do for an intervention that could help him just do that. And that could make so much better uh, quality of life for him. And But everybody sort of echoed this. And then... What, I, what we'd ever do as pulmonologists is reach out to the caregivers, hardly ever, and they were bringing up all the same things for themselves. Um, when COPD was diagnosed in my loved one, their mood changed. They started getting angry. I didn't know what to do with them. I was scared. I never left the house. I became socially isolated myself and fearful and anxious. So I wish I could give them a can of air, somebody mm -hmm. said. So they were starting to express a lot of anxiety, and I had I'd seen it. 
but they were telling it to me and I had exemplary quotes in the paper, which were just fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned anxiety here and one of the key themes that you describe are emotional issues. Uh, when we think, when I think about the patients I've seen with COPD, anxiety seem, does seem to come to the fore more so than depression. And I wonder if that's part of the physical manifestations of the illness itself. Being short of breath is a state that causes anxiety in many people. I wonder if that is borne out in your research. Yeah, that's that's for sure. I mean, it's like drawing back to Maslow's hierarchy. I mean, you've got to try to think about survival and you're going to think about, you're going to be very anxious when you can't breathe. So yeah, there's a vicious cycle there that perpetuates itself. And I think that there is often even a phenotype because these hey, people have smoked their whole life. And so smoking, anxiety, depression are all intricately tied together and self-medicate by smoking, you know. And so it, it, depression exists in COPD. And so I wouldn't forget about that also. All right. So we have these, these palliative care needs, these needs for early palliative care in these individuals. So just going to re restate them, coping with COPD, emotional symptoms, respiratory symptoms, illness understanding, and prognostic awareness. What did you do next in your kind of research on this topic? So simultaneously, I was also interviewing clinicians from palliative care and pulmonary medicine to get their take on early palliative care. And that was pretty eye-opening. If you're going to try to design any system level intervention or interventions at all, you need to be able to understand what the frontline clinicians are thinking about the field. Um, and that was pretty interesting because we did a qualitative study where we interviewed pulmonary critical care clinicians and palliative care clinicians about early palliative care and COPD and found a lot of barriers and facilitators to bringing early palliative care to this patient population. They were in themes of like educational themes, clinical themes, and operational themes. Those are the three big categories. But fundamentally, pulmonologists were, you know, like they do in cancer and like 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 people do in oncology, didn't get the, the term palliative care correct. How so? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was fundamental, fundamentally interchanged over and over through the interview. It was only useful for end-of-life care. And it was often switched with hospice back and forth. Uh -huh. So it was synonymous with hospice and end-of-life care. Yeah, you probably heard that jazz too much. Uh, yeah, that so sounds familiar. Yep. But, you know, it's, 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 it's more fascinating because pulmonary critical care, we deal, we work with palliative care clinicians all the time in the ICU. So I was expecting to have some semblance of, you know what this is, guys. You know, you know but the critical care clinicians are trained to bring people back from the brink of death. It's part of our, like, it's part of our core. We're trained to intubate, to shock, to resuscitate. So that's where I started to have that pally palm concept to somebody that can look at that person uh, like and think she's 88 92 years old with pneumonia respiratory failure i can intubate i can use high flow nasal cannula i can think about opioid morphine for dyspnea i can start thinking about other measures in a fan even and should i do it should i do this what would be best interest for her and, you know that kind of thing is the power of having both in your hands is pretty cool do the pulmonologists have any other concerns about palliative care yeah, so then they raise the clinical stuff, like when do we refer to palliative care? Uh, aren't they going to narc up my patients? Um, ah, aren't this, they, yeah, yeah, are they going to give them too many benzos until they have a respiratory arrest? And then how are you supposed to add palliative care stuff to our already busy clinical life? And is palliative care going to be able to handle COPD? Because the numbers are infinitely larger than cancer. Yes, huge numbers. Did the palliative care doctors have similar concerns or what were their concerns, if any? Yeah, so their concerns were close. I mean, they, they recognized the misconceptions that pulmonologists would see. So they knew that those existed. They too were concerned about how to manage opioids and benzos and COPD and when would be the appropriate triggers and how to prognosticate in COPD. And then would they have the bandwidth? So it, it paralleled nicely um, between both disciplines. Do you want to say more about this concern about um, uh, use of opioids and benzodiazepines uh, in patients with pre-existing lung disease? Yeah, I think it's I think it always refers to things like high chronic hypercapnia and 
this sort of hypoventilation state, you give too much opioids to somebody in that state, you may actually cause enough respiratory suppression to to precipitate a respiratory arrest. And in COPD, that could lead to hypercapnia, acute hypercapnic failure, in which case they might become somnolent, obtundent, and need to be intubated. Can we, you just say what hypercapnia is for our listeners who are not? Great point. High, high carbon dioxide levels. And that's what makes people sleepy, and people with COPD have high CO2 a lot, and makes them real tired, and then they can become obtunded, which point I come in and intubate. Happens all the time up here in the ICU. That's often one of the reasons for transfer. Wait, sorry. Is one of the reasons for transfer hypercapnia, or is it opioid-related hypercapnia? I mean, it can be opioid-related hypercapnia, or just hypercapnia from a COPD exacerbation. Mm. So you believe that this concern about opioids leading to hypercapnia um, uh, for patients with COPD, in other words, the opioid themselves slows down the respiratory rate, so that people with COPD who are at risk for building up um, CO2 in their bloodstream already, that's further exacerbated by the low respiratory rate, and they're not blowing off that CO2. That CO2 accumulates in their bloodstream, makes them sleepy, they are unable to protect their airway, and they're at risk for, you know, not breathing. <laughs> right, right. That's exactly right. I mean, I'm, I'm not stating it as I'm, I'm opposed to it. Rather, yeah. I think it needs to be a combined effort between a palliative care clinician and a pulmonologist working together to find the right dose that would be safe enough. And I have had patients personally who have started low-dose opioids and have had tremendous benefit in relieving their dyspnea. So it's not without question that it could help. It's just something that's a lot different clinically than someone with cancer where you could do that a little bit more freely. And I also want to refer to our listeners, if you want to learn more about dyspnea, both in COPD and cancer, we did a podcast about a month ago with David Currow from Australia, a really great topic. We talked a lot about the research behind this, including uh, the evidence base for opioids and dyspnea. Uh, and I think the, the one of the key take-homes is usually those are smaller doses of opioids given as long-acting medications. But again, I really encourage you to listen to the David Carroll podcast. But interested to hear what you use when you say low-dose opioids. What, what are you using? Like oxycodone, like five milligrams twice a day as needed, something like that. And I find that that won't hurt anybody. Twice a day? So yeah. the half-life is short enough that it's like four to six hours or something. Right. You give it twice a day. Yeah, I'd probably be okay with that. Yeah, but in more than that, you might be concerned. I'd be a little bit more concerned, but again, yeah. I'm still just starting out. So yeah. Right, right. Would you ever use liquid morphine? In the, in the, yeah, in the inpatient setting, I would use two milligrams IV morphine uh-huh. when I can see them in visual and watch them, right. and I'd give them much more frequently. Yeah. And it, I'd, I'd observe that, and I can see it, and I'm okay with it. And just a shout out to our listeners again. I think the one for me, the one big take home from David Carreau was like all the studies are long acting opioids, but they have formulations of long acting that we don't have here in the U.S. generally, which is lower dose. So someone out there, give us a low dose, long acting formula. (laughs) We need that. Um, And the other take home from the David Carreau podcast was for people with moderate to severe shortness of breath who were started on long-acting opioids, there were no harms in terms of uh, respiratory depression that rose to the level of clinical alarm. In the studies, using low-dose, long-acting opioids. Right. So how does that convert to clinical medicine is another question. Right. Yeah, and I mean, some studies have shown some adverse events in older adults in particular. So we do have to be cautious about yeah. The opioids and benzos in that population anyway. So just keep throwing it out there. So w- going back to kind of what you've learned from th- the the palliative care doctors, the pulmonologists, um, w- was there uh, a consensus of who should get kind of specialty level palliative care? Yeah, probably. Um, I mean, people gave some referral criteria and almost all of them thought the clinician side thought you get a certain FEV1 in the like 50%, so that would put you at around moderate 
or be up, be up, severe to very severe COPD if you're using these staging criteria. So it's a lung function on a pulmonary function test. People who have severe shortness of breath, uh, frequent hospitalizations became brought up as criteria. You're admitted in you or you get admitted to the ICU in particular. I don't know if you guys know that, but a person who's admitted for a COPD exacerbation, they one in four uh, may die in the year after that. Mm. And one in two will die within four years. So mm. a severe exacerbation is a pretty uh, sentinel event for COPD. Um, so th everything that you saw in residency and admitted, those people have a high mortality in the next year. So that's an immediate trigger for me that they probably need some palliative care at that point. Mm -hmm. um, starting things like BiPAP um, and or um, having things like depression and anxiety. But the list was huge. What could be brought up with frequent hospitalizations kept coming up over and over. Yeah. So um, it sounds like part of that is from a prognosis standpoint, their prognosis may be significantly worse. And when I think about COPD too, I think one of the challenges is prognostication. Like I can look at like the Bode index. Is it Bode yeah. or Bode? Uh, I think Bode. Yeah, Bode. I do Bode. <laughs> okay. um, the Bode index, which doesn't really help you, is it gives you like a four-year prognostic like idea based on quartiles. I don't find it incredibly helpful. Like, how do you right. think about prognosis and COPD? Good question. I mean, I think of it, you've seen everybody that has, I've seen people with the worst lung function you can imagine live for years. And so that's the challenge with we, which we face in putting palliative care to a chronic disease state is this longer lifetime that they have it with way poorer quality of life in many senses than some with advanced cancer. And Amy Kelly put out a great paper that so that they, people with COPD have dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, pain, anxiety, all of this often on in proportion with advanced cancer. How do you prognosticate? I mean, I think it's an individual level uh, without using the scores. We know what the scores can do, but you still kind of say, you still sort of paint that picture of the unknown trajectory and bringing, raise that up to the patient and just tell, being honest with them about, we, you know, we, we don't know that trajectory, but we do know the, some data, we have some data we can tell you, but you could live a long time. But here's what we do know. Your lung function will decline over your lifespan. You won't be able to walk to the mailbox and back next year. You may not be able to. In two years, you might not be able to get out of your house. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I start talking, I start painting realistic things. I start drawing in their life space for them and start using that to guide me with their prognosis. So like, what do you want to do? Oh, I just want to get up and down my steps of my apartment. Ooh, okay, we can do that. You want to go walk to your church, which is a mile away? I don't see that happening right yet, unless we do a few things. So I tie it into simple, simple, simple stuff. Yeah, that was a great segment just there. You just I highlighted like three incredibly important concepts and probably more. One, acknowledging and normalizing the uncertainty inherent in prognosis for patients with COPD. So much less predictable in terms of mortality than cancer. But nonetheless, there are predictable, there is predictably going to be a loss of function and that you frame that in terms of what people care about, particularly older adults, how are they going to get around and get out to do the things they enjoy doing? And how is that going to change over time? And that you frame that in terms of the concept of life space, which is a contribution from the university, from UAB university right. of Alabama UAB, at Birmingham. Yep. That's shout out to Richard Allman and Cynthia Brown and uh, Pat Patricia Sawyer, some of the creators of that instrument. I want. Could you just say a little bit more? Not. I'm not. You know, few of our listeners are researchers, but uh, many of them will intuitively grasp this concept of life space. I know. I want to just give you an opportunity to get in a soapbox, talk about it a little bit. Yeah, sure. I've been studying life space and COPD in parallel to this because I think it's just a fascinating concept. They've. Uh, Cynthia Brown, Richard Allman were some of my mentors about 15 years ago here at UAB as a young whippersnapper undergrad studying sort of geriatrics principles here. And life space is, a, is your sort of your, your immediate surroundings. It's the 
but it's an instrument that was developed here uh, that calculates your distance, your frequency, and independence of movement among five life space levels. Your rooms and where you sleep, around your house, immediately outside your house, to your neighborhood, and outside your town. And it paints this beautiful picture of how somebody can go from one room all the way outside of their town. And it tracks nicely with numerous outcomes in older adults in the UAB study of aging. It predicted nursing home admissions, hospitalizations, um, mortality. So when you, when you say you're restricted in your life space, there's a certain score that will predict with reasonable certainty you can get admitted to a nursing home pretty soon if you're an older adult. And I found that restricted life space in pilot study uh, predicts a COPD exacerbation and tracks nicely with many functional outcomes for COPD patients. Mm -hmm. And what I like about what you did just there a moment ago was to describe how a person's life space would be impacted by disease pr progression. In other words, as their disease progresses, their life space is likely going to constrict. And yet you were finding out what's important to them and aligning those important activities with ways that you might be able to accommodate, help support them to improve their quality of life, which is terrific. Yeah, we need, we need payer support, though, because you know, imagine something as simple as supplemental oxygen. And you think about a frail, tiny, older female with COPD who weighs 95 pounds, asking her to tote a you know, 5 to 10-pound oxygen tank around. That becomes a tether, right? You know, you guys love the term, I put my geriatrician hat. I've got to figure out a way to get that tether not to keep her in the house because she wants to wear her diamond earrings and go to church. And she doesn't want to be kept and use that tether to keep her at home. And I get that all the time. That's a, that's a weekly occurrence. This is gonna trap me in my home. This is a ball and chain. How am I supposed to tote this thing around? And, um, but if you think about it, they often don't leave their room because of their supplemental oxygen. Um, it's a fall hazard. The, the, the tubing goes around the house. They're about to trip all over it and they can't get it. It's both liberating and trapping at the same time. And so I, I think of it in, in a geriatrician's mindset, oh my God, I gotta figure out making sure they don't get stuck at home because of this thing. It's just a simple way. And you, you brought up payers um, and you know potentially systems factors. I'd love to talk just briefly about the American Journal of Medicine article that you published also on end-of-life spending and healthcare utilization for these COPD patients, older COPD patients. Do, do you want, is it okay if you kind of summarize kind of what you did in, in that article and what you found? Yeah, that was a retrospective study of Dartmouth Atlas data and older decedents with COPD. We had 140,000 decedents with COPD older than 65 years. Um, we examined spending and utilization in the last two years of life. So these are decedents who died in 2013 and 2014. We looked at overall spending and categorical spending across inpatient and outpatient categories. 40% um, of the spending came from an inpatient, but the remaining 60% went to all sorts of other ambulatory services. Um, utilization was through the roof, as you can imagine. Um, roughly 80% were admitted to the hospital in their last two years of life. Half were admitted to an ICU. The length of stay was very high. Um, but what was amazing to me was that as a population health standpoint, there was tremendous variability across the country um, in ways that different uh, referral regions spent and utilized. I guess it's like if you build it, they will come mentality. Mm -hmm. Highly, highly populated urban centers had high rates of utilization and longer lengths of stay. And those things track nicely. But the take home was more so than that was the hospice utilization. We hadn't had any real concrete data on hospice and COPD. There was, I went into this knowing that palliative care was very abysmally utilized. I mean, we're talking 1%. Any study that I read was like 1% of this sample, 1% of that sample. It was a tremendous increase from 0.3 to 0.9%, something like that. That's what I've read over and over and over. Mm. I said, well, that's just sad. Yeah. And I knew that the data from things like NHPCO or Hospice and Palliative Care Organization was that roughly 50% of older decedents get, uh, get hospice near the end of life. And we found something similar, about 47% of older COPD decedents 
received hospice. And though currently, from what I can tell, the average uh, length of stay in hospice is 70 days for the average population, um, and that's been kind of growing slowly over the last few years, in that time period, ours was um, 39 days on average. So COPD patients are going real late, and, uh, and hospice didn't track with spending like all the other categories did. What do you mean by it didn't track with spending? I mean, it meant that um, all the other categories, things like acute care, length of stay, LTAC, length of stay, skilled nursing facilities, all of those had some association. You had more utilization of it, yeah. your spending increased. But with hospice, things were pretty flat across the, uh, 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 there, was, there wasn't a linear association with spending there. And so my take home was that we were referring too late. There was widely variable geographic utilizations. Some places were super low. Some patients, places were decently high. But if we're going to try to make an impact on outcomes like has been shown in cancer, we can't wait till the last month of life to, um, to do this. So that's why you need early palliative care. So what's next for you? So you, you've, you've taught us that there's, there's high symptom needs, emotional needs, uh, coping needs for individuals with COPD, huge utilization issues, um, healthcare utilization, that we're not using palliative care early enough. Like what's, what's next for you? Oh yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it, it, so there's a lot of unknowns in the next few months. Um, but it, it, these, all this data provided uh, tremendous background data for a grant that, um, that's, uh, that's out there. And so depending on how that goes, that's what I'm trying to build an intervention, um, an early palliative care intervention modeled by prior successful early palliative care interventions in cancer, tailored to older adults with COPD, um, specifically focusing on things like life space and uh, physical function frailty, those kind of things, and see how this kind of intervention can impact it using a pilot trial mechanism. So that's what I'd like to do, you know, make the career bigger, um, get the pulmonologist and knock them on the head, tell them we need to do these things more. That's so, great. Yeah. Teach them what palliative care is. Pally Palm. That's exactly right, guys. <laughs> it's not hospice. Hey, um, <laughs> have, you heard of, <laughs> have you heard of other uh, programs that have uh, Pally Palm, are there successful models elsewhere in the country of practice, uh, outpatient palliative care clinics, for example, that are seeing quite a few patients with COPD? Uh, there was one in Canada where they integrated for interstitial lung disease um, pretty well. Uh, they integrated palliative care using like nurse practitioners. I've had some, some colleagues in Illinois and elsewhere embed a palliative care clinician in their, in their pulmonary clinics. Um, those are reasonable and seem to be large scale scalable options, but I think it's going to have to be that, you know, you, you guys know this, there's not enough to go around and we need, we need pulmonologists and primary care clinicians to get the message and learn the skill sets. If we're going to have a chance to meet the deficit of palliative care and geriatricians that are that's coming in the next decade. Yeah, absolutely. We need models like enable which is right telephone based nurse led isn't it in intervention we're gonna have a podcast with marie bakaitis um in a month or so yeah i'm excited about that yeah learn more about enable you guys yeah yeah that's that's what my my intervention's modeled after and and i know it's sort of preliminarily feasible in patients with copd now we just need to tailor it to the older adult population but you know we just need to make sure the pulmonologists know what palliative care is that's a pretty problem. Well, there, there's 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 things I think that pulmonologists need to know. I'm wondering, like, are there a couple things that, as geriatricians or as palliative care clinicians, that you really wish that we knew, um, or like pet peeves that you have? <laughs> yeah, that, this this is a tough question. Um, I don't think you guys see see enough of them to to maybe get the experience. And I even in my study. Palliative care clinicians were concerned about what medicines like antidepressants and anxiolytics would do to COPD patients. And I think if you gave us a call, we could work together to find a right dose that we would be that would be safe. And we did this discussion throughout this podcast, right? That opioids are not necessarily harmful, but if you do it at the right 
right those we might be able to work together then talking with us about prognostication um i'm one that can bring it up early but some of my colleagues don't want to refer to you guys because they feel like there's there's people are throwing in the towel um and i don't think that's right i think that they're got you're gonna to have to work with us and figure out what that what that prognosis means and how do you define that better i got another question for you so I'm really excited about um, Pally Palm. I want to learn more about it. You know, actually, we are here at um, uh, at our institution. We're actually uh, working on trying to get palliative care integrated with uh, pulmonary clinic, chest clinic with Neil Trevetti and others like that and Usher and Cotwall from palliative care. Um, if I want to kind of dive deeper into this, what can I do to get more involved in the Pally Palm community? Well, we're on Twitter. That's where we started at, at Pally Palm. And you could pull up all the hashtags using the model of this famous podcast that I've heard about called Jerry Powell Blog. We're trying to do I've the heard same. about that before. Yeah, we're trying to do this similar uh, uh, model and build that this year. That's the goal for this year is to start, you know, I, I was, I thought, I know people across the country and across the world that are interested in this topic. They have to exist. And in the course of nine months, I found 1,200 people. Wow. Whoa. So this is worldwide. We have people all over India that are tagging hashtag Pali Palm that are like, wait a minute, this is what I do. I'm an interventional pulmonologist. I love this concept. And so then you've got people currently, one of my mentees, Dina Khatib, who is at Mount Sinai, finish your pulmonary critical care fellowship now doing a year in palliative care up there in uh, Mount Sinai. So, you know, you've got people that exist in the world where we're putting a face and a title to it. And then soon going to provide a resource where people can come to find out more information, probably online. It'll be a blog format. What about uh, a podcast? Uh, yeah. Sounds uh, like a uh. thing. Sounds like a great idea. So that's, 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 something we need to start thinking about how to do and, and doing it. <laughs> do you play the guitar? <laughs> do I play the guitar with piano. Piano. There you That's go. It's got to be different. <laughs> Love yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I learned a ton. I want to thank, thank you, you for Anna. joining us. Anything else you want to uh, talk about with Pally Palm? No, man, this is it. I loved it. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for giving me a place to talk about it. Well, Thank you can't you so leave much. now because you got a little bit more song left. Mm -hmm. Let's hear it, Alex. One, two, three. One, two, three. Well, you need to have it. With long tall Sally, the twisting with Lucy, through the Watusi. Hold on to your back. I said I like it like that. I do the jerk. Watch me all work, y'all. forever <laughs> i could always tell when alex loves playing a song uh, fun. Yeah, show, guys. google it you'll you'll blow it to blow your mind that's the best yeah well again a big big thank you for joining us and to all of our listeners for joining us and supporting the jerry pal podcast thank if you'd you to like Artstone. to support the jerry pal podcast you can always go to your favorite podcasting app and rate us and alex what did you say i said thank you to artstone foundation good night everybody bye folks <laughs>